Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word. We know it's being written in our heart and our mind. We thank you that you opened the eyes of our understanding, given us a spirit of wisdom, revelation, and knowledge of you. We thank you as we take hold of it and we do it. We thank you it's going to produce much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've begun sharing with you this morning on the subject of the grace of God. It is very important that we understand the grace of God. And we see the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12, where he speaks, he says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. Notice, there's a true grace of God, and then there's a false grace of God that is being taught. Unfortunately, there have been those that have taught false things. We see in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Galatian mar uh, uh, Paul marveled about the church of Galatia. He said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And he goes on and says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are those that have perverted the gospel of Christ because they have not taught the truth according to the word of God. The grace of God is important for us to understand. When we talk about the grace of God, we see the fact that this particular word is the word charis, and it simply means grace or favor, the favor of God. Many people have defined the grace of God as unmerited favor. That's what they say that it means. But it doesn't mean unmerited favor. It simply means favor. So get that out of your mind. People have had that definition for a long time. I heard that for years and years. But that's not really what it is. It is the favor of God that God will extend, and he will extend it. He's the one who's in charge of it. He's the one that puts it forth. Man cannot cause it as far as to make God do it. God's the one who gives grace. And we're going to, we've looked at the Old Testament scriptures, and we saw the fact that there are conditions for the grace of God. The reason why this is especially important, because there's many out there that teach that the grace of God is just automatic in your life, that it is irresistible, that it automatically comes upon you, and now the grace of God is with you throughout your life once you're born again. The same group teach you that you're automatically perfectly righteous once you're born again as well. Both of those teachings are false. We have already given you scriptures throughout the Old Testament, as well as some in the New, showing the fact that the grace of God has conditions. That when you meet the conditions, then God will show forth his grace toward us. And we're going to continue on this evening in the New Testament, picking up the scriptures and showing the fact of how the grace of God works, how it comes forth in one's life, what conditions are being met in people's lives that cause it to happen, and what the grace of God will do for you. And it is very important. In Luke chapter 1, we see in verse 30, here's where the angel visited Mary. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. We mentioned over and over that you see this phrase about finding favor, finding grace. They found grace in the sight of the Lord. If you find grace in the sight of the Lord, that means someone is looking at you and observing you, and must, what you're doing causes you to, them, you to find grace in their sight. They look upon you with grace because of what you're doing. You must realize that grace is going to be extended because of the conditions that we have met. Now, when it talks about Mary, you don't see a whole lot about Mary to find out what kind of a life that she had. But obviously, she found favor with God, and she was highly favored of him. And we see over in verse 38, it says, Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. The angel departed from her. Notice she called herself a handmaid of the Lord. See, God looks upon a person and he sees what's in their life. And she was a handmaid of the Lord. That meant she was a, a bondmaid, so to speak, as is what it means, of the Lord. She was submissive to the Lord. She was yielded to the Lord. We see another scripture over in verse 45 that indicates something about Mary. Here it says, and blessed is she that believed. This is Elizabeth speaking here. 
And blessed is she that believe, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Otherwise, she was one who would believe. She was one who would receive the message that the angel brought forth. But she wouldn't be in doubt like Zacharias was. Instead, she was one who would believe. So another reason why she would have gotten grace in the sight of the Lord. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. She was one who would praise the Lord, certainly showing the fact that she had some sort of relationship with him. We see, she says, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So here again, she would rejoice in him and keep her eyes upon him. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, again calling herself handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, acknowledging that he's mighty, acknowledging that he's holy. These are certainly all characteristics of someone who had a relationship with the Lord. And because of that fact, then we see the fact that God brought forth his grace toward her and chose her to be the one where the word was going to be made flesh and was going to be imparted in her, which was Jesus coming to pass. So again, God will look upon someone's heart in their life and see what is in you. And because of that, that's why the grace of God was extended towards her. In Luke chapter 2, down in verse 40, here it's speaking about Jesus. And it says here, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Again, this is talking about Jesus when they're here. He formed all the things that according to the law that turned to Galilee, the own city, Nazareth. So it's talking about Jesus. And notice it says that he grew. When you look at this particular word here, grew, it's in the imperfect tense, which means literally it would say the child was growing and waxed strong, this particular one, is also in the imperfect tense, showing this is past tense, but it's continuous action in the past, which would be translated was being strengthened, was being strengthened. Young gets it somewhat right, was strengthened, would be okay, was being strengthened in spirit. And then when it talks about being filled here, it's again present tense, continuous repeated action, was being filled with wisdom, was being filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was, the word was, also is in the imperfect tense, was continually that the grace of God was upon him. Now, if you look at this, you can see that he was growing continually. He was being strengthened continually. He was being filled with wisdom continually. And the grace of God was continually upon him. You can see the fact that God's grace is upon a person as they're growing spiritually, as they're being strengthened and empowered by the Lord, as they're being filled with the wisdom of God. What this means is the fact that in the measure that you have been growing spiritually, that you are becoming strengthened in the Word of God, strengthened within in power, and that you are filled up with the wisdom of God, that in that measure will be the grace of God, because as this is working, it's God's grace that's working in your life through the working of the Word of God. So, we see another principle, conditions that show forth how the grace of God will work, and God wants His grace to grow and develop in your life. Remember that scripture that we looked at, just to be a reminder that we looked at this morning. Grace is something that God gives, but it's also something that you are to grow in. 2 Peter 3.18 Grow in grace. Now, if God was totally in control of it and we had nothing to do with it, he'd never tell us, and command us, grow in grace. Otherwise, there's things that we do that cause us to grow in favor with God. So, this teaching that says that God's given us grace, he's in total control and we don't do anything about it, it's a lie. You and I are to do the things that cause us to grow in grace. And we see exactly what Jesus was doing that caused the grace of God to be upon him. Remember, he operated as a man. He did not operate as God. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The verb in the sentence is increased. We look at the word increased. It happens to also be in the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense, again, is a past tense, but it's continuous and ongoing in action. 
So it literally is saying Jesus was increasing, or Young's brings out was advancing, was increasing in or advancing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So again, as he was increasing in wisdom, he was also increasing with favor with God and man. How do we get wisdom? Through the word of God that we hear and we do and apply it in our life and it's going to be imparted to us. Again, this shows how are you going to grow in grace? How are you going to grow in favor with God and man? Because you're going to get in the word and hear and do the word and you're going to get wisdom. As you increase in wisdom and the measure that you've increased in wisdom will be the measure that you have favor with God and man. That is why it's so important for us to get ourselves in the word of God. So, Grace and favor can and will increase in your life. And we need to do the things that he says in order to see it come to pass. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. It says, If you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. When we look up all the words, which you have to look up with all the words, you'll find that the word grace is used here. You say, well, I don't see the word grace. But when you put the word over thank, notice the word. It's the same word, charis, that we've been talking about all along. It says, if you love them which love you, what grace? Young's actually corrects the error. What favor will you have if you just love those that love you? That's, no, that's a piece of cake. You love me? Oh, sure, I'll love you back. You're treating me good. But what's going to bring favor? When you love someone who doesn't love you, when you love the unlovely, when you love the people that have been evil towards you or done evil things to you. Sinners also love those who love us. That's nothing special. Otherwise, you get grace from God when you do what God wants, not just responding out of what man would do or what's natural. God, you get grace from God when you do what God wants you to do, which is to love everybody. If you do good to them which do good to you, what thank or what grace have you? What grace have you? For sinners also do even the same. Otherwise, remember what we're to do? We're to do good to everybody. We're to good, do good to those who do evil to us. We're not to do evil back to them. But if you will do good to those who've done evil, then you're going to find grace with God because you're following His Word and not just doing things out of the natural. If you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what grace have you again? Same thing, same word. For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Otherwise, if you lent to someone and they didn't pay you back, here of whom you hope to, whom you hope to receive, you, you know, there's no big deal if they pay you back, but how about someone who didn't pay you back or can't pay you back? Is that gonna, are you going to have an attitude about that? Or are you just going to give it unto them? You know, when you lend to the Lord, you lend to people, you lend, pity on the poor, you lend to the Lord, and God will repay you. His grace and His favor will be towards you. So what we see is the fact that for those who love their enemies, do good and lend with expecting nothing again, in the sense, it doesn't matter whether they get it back or not, what God says that you are going to have grace from Him. And you are going to see that you are going to be rewarded. He says in verse 35, love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing again. Your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Grace will come to you when you do what God says, not doing things responding out of just normal, natural behavior. So we want to be sure that we do what God wants. Every time you do his word, grace is going to be shown to you. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, see, Grace is, comes in your life through every time you're doing the Word. Essentially, as you're doing the Word, which is the Word of His grace, it's producing grace in your life. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Of course, who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And He's the Word. And how does He work now? Through the Word of God in you. Jesus comes to you as you receive the Word. And the Word is full of grace and truth. So this is again why it's essential for you to get the Word of God in you. And to walk in it, it will produce God's favor in your life. Here in verse 16, Of His fullness have we all received. The word receive is lambano, 
We take hold of his, his, his fullness and grace for grace. As we take hold of all the things which he's full of grace and truth, we're going to see grace upon grace is going to be manifested in our life. You're going to keep on seeing more grace. Because remember, you're going to grow in grace. You're going to see grace manifest and increase in it in your life. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Remember, there was grace in the Old Testament, but it was only that which would affect them in the natural realm circumstances. In the New Testament, now, in order to come into relationship with God, it only comes through Jesus Christ because you've got to receive Him first as your personal Lord and Savior and get a brand new spirit so you're right with Him. And then, as you walk in His ways, you're going to see that grace and truth is going to come to you on all aspects because now it's going to come to you in the realm of the Spirit as you are doing the Word of God. So, what we see is in the measure you get the Word in you, is the, and you're doing the Word, is the measure that the grace of God will be manifest to you. And as you take hold of His fullness, you're taking hold of the grace and, and the truth through Jesus. We see another thing that will cause the grace of God to be manifest in your life. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat, with gladness and singleness of heart. What were they doing? They were out there preaching the gospel to these people, house to house, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Otherwise, as they're out witnessing, you're out preaching the gospel, you're doing the work of the Lord, you're going to have favor, not only with God, but also with the people. And God is going to add to the church. This simply means that if we're doing what God says, if we're out there fulfilling the Great Commission, doing the work of God, reaching out, preaching the gospel, then the favor of God is going to be upon you, and you'll have favor with the people that you come in contact with as that was what was happening, and they were being added, people were being added to the church daily, such as should be saved. We see another place over in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Acts 4, 33, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Why, was, why did this happen? Because they had a prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting here. The place where they were shaken was, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. What happens when you speak the Word? The grace of God is being released. And when you pray and you're doing what God wants, His grace is going to be coming upon you. And these ones, those that believed were of one heart, one soul, they were all in one accord. Neither said of any of them that all of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. They were ready to go forth and to do what God wanted them to do. And with great power, they gave the witness, the apostles witness of the resurrection, and great grace was upon them. God wants great power and great grace to be upon us. Great favor. And when the favor of God is upon you, whatever you put your hands to is going to prosper. It's going to be successful in your life. So, we see that as we meet the conditions to go forth and do what God says, great grace. You pray, you get involved in doing His work, His grace, His favor will be upon you in your life. In Acts chapter 7, verse 46, it speaks here about David. And speaking of David here, in here, the days of David, who found favor with God. David found favor with God. Now, why did David find favor with God? Well, if we look at some of the scriptures that talk about what David did and what God thought about him, we see over in Acts chapter 9, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 9, 1 Kings 9, verse 4, God said, If you'll walk with me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, in uprightness, to do according to all that I've commanded thee, to keep my statutes and my judgments. You do what he says. You're going to be one that's going to be, see the grace of God because he was obedient to him. We see another scripture in 1 Kings 11.4 speaking about David. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. He didn't have favor with God anymore. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David. David's heart was perfect, but Solomon's heart was not. He didn't hear a good report at the end of his days. The heart of David was perfect. God's looking for you to have a perfect heart. Another scripture in 1 Kings, chapter 14, verse 8, speaking about David. 
It says, He rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, that thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes. That again is marks of someone who's going to find favor with God. See, it's based, God's looking at you and seeing what kind of a life do you have? What are you doing? Where's your heart? And what he sees is going to determine whether he's going to give favor towards you. You can't do anything to earn it. It's not you earning it. God's looking at it and sees what's there, and he decides who he's going to have favor upon. But it's always going to be because of what you're doing of his word and what kind of a heart attitude you have. So we see that grace will come to those who walk with integrity of heart, uprightly, keep the commandments of God, follow God with all your heart, be perfect before him with a perfect heart, do only the things that are right in his sight. That means you deny yourself and you only do what God wants you to do. Then you're going to see favor come forth in your life and from God. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Here it's speaking about Barnabas when he came, he came here to Antioch. And when he came, he had seen the grace of God. The grace of God can be seen. It's going to be seen in your life because of the fruit. It can be seen of what's going on in your life, the things that you're doing. It could be seen of all the believers there in Antioch. And it says he was glad, and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. They were supposed to cleave unto the Lord, which means to remain with or continue with the Lord. And so, here, saw the grace of God in their lives, saw that they had a relationship with God. They were believing and acting and walking in His ways. And so what's He doing? He's exhorting them to continue in that. Continue with purpose of heart. Continue in the ways of the Lord. You know, you could be walking with the Lord one minute and then turn away and not walk with Him anymore. Will you have grace with God anymore after that? No. Grace is not automatically upon you just because you're born again. Think, well, God's grace is toward me. He favors me, so everything's going to be fine. That's a lie. Grace will only come to you as you are remaining and continuing. That's why he told them. He says, I saw the grace of God, so I'm saying, hey, you guys continue and remain in the, in the ways of the Lord with a right purpose of heart, and you're going to, what's what be the result? You'll continue to see the grace of God working. And that carries over, of course, for us. Acts chapter 13, verse 43. Acts 13, 40, for 43, we see something similar to this what we just said. When the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Well, what were they continuing in? They were continuing in doing the Word. Because when you do the Word, you're going to see the grace of God. In the measure that you're doing the Word is the measure that God's favor is coming to pass in your life and upon you. If you're not doing much of the Word, you're not going to see much of the favor of God. He was persuading them to continue in the grace of God. And we talk about this particular word about continuing. That shows they were already in it. Present tense. That shows you it's something that you're going to walk in. That means it's something that you know is working in your life. You're continuing in God's grace because of His word working. Present tense. Continuous repeated action. He was persuading them to continue uh, repeatedly in their life ongoing in the grace of God. So, that's what exactly what God wants for us. We see in Acts chapter 14, verse 3, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace. Where is the grace going to come from? From God and how? Through the word of His grace. This is why, again, all these people that say that, well, just irresistible grace and God's already determined it. He's just chosen to have grace on whoever he wants to do, irrespective of what you do. It's a lie. It's a false teaching. It is not the true grace of the Lord. God's grace comes from those who he chooses to put the grace, give his grace to because they're meeting the conditions. They're doing his word. It's the word of his grace. How, does, how are you going to grow in grace? Get the word in you. Hear and do the word. And what happened? The, remember, when you get the word in you, they got full of power, of great power, and they had great grace upon them. The power of God comes into you through the word, and the grace of God is in you through the word, and great power and great grace will be upon you, and you go forth and do the works of God. 
What happened here? Same thing. Gave testimony in the word of his grace, and he granted signs and wonders to be done. Saw all these miraculous works being done. You see, as you get the word in you and you go forth to do the word of God, God's going to flow through you because of the grace of God that will be upon you because you're obeying him and doing what he tells you to do. In Acts chapter 14, down here in verse 26, then sailed to Antioch from thence they'd been recommended or given, this means, to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. So, you're given to the grace of God when you go out to do the work of God. If you're out there doing the work of God, you're out there witnessing, you're actually being given to the grace of God. And God's operating through you. So that means grace is going to be upon you. If you're given to the grace of God, the grace of God will be working on your behalf. And that means you're going to see the favor of God coming upon you. That's exactly what we want. So, go forth. Do the things God says. Preach the gospel. Pass out tracts. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. Speak the word to people. Go out there and be a light. As you're doing that, you're going to be given the grace of God for the work that you're carrying out and for the work which they fulfilled. We see over in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, we're seeing the working of the grace of God. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Literally, when you look at this, well, Young's really brings it out more literally. He says, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we believe to be saved. And that's exactly what it actually says in the Greek. The particular word here about believing up here is in a, as you see, the word believing is in the uh, present tense, continuous repeated action, meaning that you continually believe. And then here when it talks about saved here, where it says saved, it's actually an infinitive. It's, I don't know why they translated it as the main verb, we shall be saved. No, it's to be saved. That's why Young's correctly translates it. We believe continuously to be saved, which means salvation is going to come if you continue to believe. You quit believing, you're not going to be in that status of being saved if you don't continue to believe. You draw back in unbelief or you turn away from him, you won't be in that status of being saved any longer. In Acts chapter 15, in verse 40. So as we believe, the grace of God will be upon us. Paul chose Silas, departed, being recommended or given by the brethren unto the grace of God. Again, you go to preach the gospel, you're being given unto the grace of God. Another thing we see about the grace of God in Acts chapter 20, down here in verse 24. Paul said, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received. What's the word received? Lombano. I took hold of. You've got to take hold of the ministry that God has for you. You lay hold upon it and carry it out, which I have taken hold of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So what's the gospel? It's the gospel of the kingdom, but it's also the gospel of the grace of God. It's the good news that God's grace will come upon you when you respond to him. You receive Jesus, grace comes to you. You receive anything that he tells you to do of his word, grace is coming to you. You start hearing and doing his word, God's grace, his favor is coming upon you in your life as you are doing it. And this will affect you not only now, but also in the life to come because you will be rewarded for all the things that you do. That's why it's so important that we follow the way of the word. We see another scripture regarding the word of his grace in Acts chapter 20, in verse 32. Now, brethren, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace. How do you grow in grace? As you grow in the word, you grow in grace. Which is able, or has the power, to build you up. What's going to happen? God's word, which is his grace, is going to build you up and strengthen you. And give you an inheritance. That means... The grace of God, which is operating through the Word, is going to give you your inherited promises. They're going to come to pass in your life. You see, you've got an inheritance in Christ that belongs to you. You're heirs of God. You're joint heirs with Christ. You're to possess all the inherited promises. But notice, it's among all them that are sanctified. We must be sanctified and holy and separate from evil things. Again, if there's sin in the camp, you're not going to be built up. You're not going to be getting your inheritance. You're not going to be winning your battles. That's why we've got to deal with all sin in our life. It is absolutely important. This is why the pastors 
which is most all of them out there that aren't talking to people about dealing with sin, they're making a great mistake. They're never going to see the promises come to pass if they don't deal with the sin in their life. Now over in Romans, in Romans, the word grace is actually used 21 times. We're not going to look at all of them, but we'll look at a number of these. 21 times it's used in the letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, one we looked at this morning, but notice what it says. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. The word received, lambano, took hold of grace. Grace is not just something that God gives and you don't do anything about. God comes from God, but you've got to take hold of it. Whatever he gives you, you have to take hold of it with your faith and begin to operate it. He received the grace of God and apostleship, which was his ministry. So whatever God has called you to, you've got to take hold of it and then begin to operate in it when, as God is leading you and directing you and as he's opened doors and, and the taught depending upon what it is that he's called you to. For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. He was to go preach the gospel to all the nations so that they could obey the true faith and get born again. So it's not automatically manifest to you from the call of God on your life. You've got to take hold of whatever God has called you to. Over in Romans chapter 3, we see in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. The redemption by Jesus was His grace to us. He's showing his favor toward us to redeem us. And so because of that, we then, we receive Jesus. We have, are declared righteous freely by his grace as when we receive it. But we got to receive it. This is why I remember that by grace we are saved through faith. Otherwise, we take hold of it with our faith in order to see the grace of God manifest and produce the righteousness in our life, which is what justification means. So, the redemption by Jesus is His grace to us, so we can be declared righteous freely by faith in Jesus. That's why you've got to receive Him. See, many people just believe out there. There's lots of people out there in the church world that just believe, but they've never received Jesus. They believe something, but they've never received the promises. And if you don't take hold of them with your faith, they're not going, it's not going to come to pass. And even though the grace of God's available for you, you aren't taking hold of it and seeing it work in your life. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If it wasn't coming from God, just because well, because God's choosing to give it to you because of what, what he sees in your life, if it was out of debt, I did it, I deserve it, you have to give it to me, that'd be a different story. No. You cannot earn it. You cannot earn grace. God is the one who gives it to you. But there are conditions for why he gives it to you, because of what he sees in your life. But you have not earned it as such. Well, I earned it, and you got to give it to me. God is not, it's not a thing where you earn it, and then so, therefore, I, it belongs to me. No. It is favor that God gives to you because he sees what you're doing in your life, and he chooses to give it to you, of course, because of those things. In Romans chapter 5, we see over here in verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Notice, everything we do is with our faith, and we have access into the grace wherein we stand. The, the access into the grace, what's the grace? It's the grace of relationship with Him, the grace that brought forth righteousness, the grace that brought forth, if we've been redeemed, and we're now with Him, and we now have His Word, we have access through faith into all the grace. The grace is all the blessings, all the favor that he wants to bring forth for you, all the promises that belong to us. And we are to have, use our faith to enter into receiving all of the grace gifts, all the things that God has for us. We see down in verse 15, he says this, Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, is abounded unto many. There's a gift by grace. What gift is it? It's the gift of righteousness. It's righteousness. You give the gift of righteousness, as you'll see in a moment, by the grace of God. The favor of God has been shown to us by Jesus, because none of us could ever be righteous by do, be, doing, being a good person. We had to get born again. So we had to have someone who could give us their spirit 
so that we could have a spirit that's right. And there's only one person that could do that, Jesus, who accomplished the redemption and was the firstborn from the dead. So the gift by grace is going to come from him. It's a free gift. He goes on in verse 17. If by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, here's what the gift is, the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. This shows you what grace is going to do for you. The grace of God is going to enable you to reign in life. If you're going to reign, that means you're going to operate as a king, as to be a king or exercise kingly power. You're going to manifest the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. But notice what it says. Is it going to automatically happen to you just because you're in Christ? No. You're going to have to take hold of the word receive is lombano. We're putting the cursor over. Lombano means to take hold of. You're going to take hold of the abundance of grace. And how do you do that? Through his word, because that's the word of his grace, which is the promises of God that, that you're going to take hold of. So as you're taking hold of the promises, taking hold of the word, you're taking hold of the abundance of grace, God's favor. And of the gift of righteousness, because you've got to be righteous, you're going to be able to reign in life through uh, by one Jesus Christ. It goes on and says down here in verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Here, sin, sin was so shown because of the law. You've got all this sin in your life because you're not keeping the law. At the same time, though, now, grace now is available for us through Jesus Christ, and you and I can see the grace of God manifest through His Word as we hear and do His Word. You can see God, yourself grow in grace, take hold of abundance of grace, see the grace of God manifest, the favor of God on you everything, in everything that you do. Remember, Jesus was increasing in this and he was increasing in favor. God wants you to increase in the favor of God. In other words, you should see God's favor and blessing upon you every place you're going and increasing in your life. Verse 21, As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Look what grace is going to produce. Eternal life. Eternal life with Him. But it's going to reign, again, through righteousness. Notice also, as we pointed out to you this morning, but we want to point out again this evening, the word reign is conditional because it's in the subjunctive mood. That's why it's translated might reign. So grace might reign if the conditions are met Remember, the subjunctive mood means that which is contrary to fact, expressing things that are conditional upon conditions being met. Through righteousness, you're going to have to be righteous. Well, people say, well, I'm perfectly righteous because I'm born again. But why isn't the grace of God working? Well, if you're walking in sin, you're walking in the flesh, you're walking in the ways of the world, you haven't dealt with things, you let that unforgiveness get a hold of you, you got all these different things you frustrate the grace of God and you're not righteous because only those that are righteous are those that are born again and doing righteousness. And what's it going to do? It's going to produce eternal life in you. So, we see that grace is to reign. It's going to reign through righteousness. and You can rule and reign. It'll produce eternal life in you. Praise God. But remember, the grace reigning is conditional, not automatic. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Even though sin is, out, is abounding out there in the world, it will abound if you walk in the flesh. No, God forbid. You're not supposed to continue to sin so grace will abound. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're not supposed to live in sin any longer because you have no, you're dead to sin. That's why it says over here, Romans 6, 14, Sin shall not have dominion for over you, for you're not under the law. See, under the law in the Old Testament, could they triumph over sin? No, because the law brought the knowledge of sin. And they, they, couldn't, they couldn't triumph over that in their life. But now, we're under grace in the New Testament, which means we're dead to sin. So therefore, sin shall not have dominion over you. And you can see God's favor working on your behalf as you hear and do the word, and you can triumph over every sin in your life. So he says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Absolutely not. Then he comes down to verse 7, 17. And he says, God be thanked. Remember, we've got to look up all these words. I put the cursor over the word thanked. 
Look what it is. It's the word charis, talking about the word grace. It's translated grace throughout. God be graced as such that you were otherwise favored, or the way they translate it was thanks, because it's speaking about thanks really because of his grace. Giving thanks under, because of his grace is essentially favoring him, favor, showing favor towards him. And how would you show, show favor towards God? You're giving him thanks because of what he's done. God be thanked because of his grace, essentially, that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. So are you a sinner any longer? No. All these people that teach out there, well, you're, still, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I'm still a sinner. No, you're not a sinner. You were a sinner. You, the grace of God has come. You're not a sinner any longer. Don't think of yourself. If you're a sinner, that means you're a servant of sin. And you're always going to sin. That's the lying teaching out there. People always say, well, you're always going to sin because you're a sinner. It's a lie. You are not a sinner. What are you now? You are righteous in spirit. Being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. What are you a servant of? You're not a servant of sin. You are righteous, and now you are a servant of righteousness. So, we give thanks because of His grace. We're not sinners. We're now servants of righteousness, and we're to walk in His ways. And what's it going to produce? It's going to produce, yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness, and then, as it talks about, what's it going to produce then? It's going to produce the end, everlasting life, because we're servants of God. And every time you serve God, that's the grace of God working. Every time you do righteousness, that's the grace of God working. All the fruit you have is the result of the grace of God. It's nothing that you do. Everything that God has done is all the result of His grace. You are because of the, everything you are is because of the grace of God in your life. That's important. Romans chapter 11, verse 5. Now here's a scripture that people get off track on, unfortunately. Romans 11.5 says, Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The election means choosing. Aha, see, God has a certain remnant according to his choosing of grace. He chose to have grace on them, and they are the remnant. Well, let's read a little bit more and take a look at this. If by grace it's no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. If it be works, then it's no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for. Seeketh for. What was it seeking for? Righteousness. It couldn't attain it because it was trying to do it by the law. But the election, this is the ones who are the choice of grace, the election, same word. If we go back here, the election, notice it's number 1589, the word ekloge. Well, here we got it again, 1589, ekloge. So the ones who are chosen of grace, not arbitrarily by God, but the ones chosen of grace have obtained it. They obtain the righteousness. Well, who are the ones that were chosen of grace? The ones who received Jesus. Those are the ones that are chosen. Many are called, everybody's called, but who's chosen? Only the ones that accepted him. Did God extend himself calling out to all the, the Israelites, the Jews, to, to his grace? Of course he did. But well, they stumbled at the stumbling stone, which was Jesus. They rejected Jesus. So did they get the grace of God? No. Did they become righteous? No. They never obtained what they sought after. But the election, the ones who've been chosen, have obtained it. And who are that? That was all the nations that received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. So the point is, this is not talking about that there's a remnant according to God's choice of grace. No. It's the choosing of grace, but who's the one who got it? All the ones who obtained it, because the chosen ones obtained it. So that meant they did something to obtain it. It mean it wasn't God doing it. Notice, the election, they did obtain it. So if they obtained it, they're the ones that did something to get it. How do you come to the place of being righteous? You've got to receive Jesus. They accepted Jesus. So that's a, uh, where people have missed the whole boat, thinking that taking a little scripture out of context, you see, there's a remnant according to his choosing of grace, that God chose them. No. God chose 
those that chose Jesus. And that's how you come to the place of that. <coughs> Regarding Israel, by the way, <coughs> it says God's given them the spirit of slumber. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. It says down here in verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Some people think, well, God had them stumble, you know, so they'd fall so that he then could send the gospel over to uh, all the nations. Is that true? No. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. God did not cause them to stumble so they'd fall so that then the gospel would go to the nations. No. God forbid. He didn't do that. But the fact that they did fall, rather through their fall, is come to the, the Gentiles were to provoke them to jealousy. The point being is that God didn't cause them to stumble so that they'd fall. That's a lie. His will was not for that to happen. His will was for them to receive Jesus and to be right with him. Remember, the gospel first came to the Jew, but also was going to come to the Greek after that. It just came to them first. It was going, God's plan was to bring it unto them. So he did not cause them to stumble. It wasn't his plan whatsoever. Of course, look what the result was. They've been a scattered group. They've been a persecuted group forever. And so they've had so much trouble and hated because of the fact that they have not had the grace and the favor of God, although he has not forgotten them because of his covenant with Abraham and his covenant with all the prophets and what the things that they prayed. So you need to understand that. Now down in verse 19, it says, The branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Who are the branches? That was talking about the Jews. Why? Because of unbelief they were broken off. Otherwise, they wouldn't believe they got broken off. Thou standest by faith, be, be not high-minded, but fear. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Otherwise, just because you've been grafted in today, that doesn't mean that you're automatically grafted in forever. Behold, therefore, there's the boldness, goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, and toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt also be cut off. That destroys once saved, always saved, right there, doesn't it? Okay. These people that believe once saved, always saved, they must, not, they must have taken this verse out of their Bible, or they ignore it. If you continue his goodness, you're okay. But if not, you also will be cut off. That's pretty clear. It's amazing how people believe these lies. At the same time, if you're cut off, can you come back in? Sure. They also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God's able to graft them in again. If you confess your sin, repent, turn, and receive him and come back to him. We see down in verse 26. We see what's going to happen for Israel, though. All Israel shall be saved. Otherwise, they're going to come to the place of repentance. And God's foreknowledge, he understands what's going to happen. As it's written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. There's time, there's a time coming that this is going to happen. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. See, remember, he still has a covenant with them, the old covenant that he made with them. They're supposed to come to the new covenant. That's the covenant that's going to bring them into a relationship with God. But it says here, they're still part of God's chosen ones. Look what it says about in Romans 11:28. As concerning the gospel, they're enemies because they're resistant to the gospel and try to stop. They won't let him let people preach the gospel over in Israel. As touching election that have been chosen, they're beloved for their father's sake. God, what this is referring to is those that can be chosen. As touching election, they're beloved. They are to be chosen. As soon as they come to repentance, as soon as they come to the place of choosing Jesus, then they are going to come to it. Remember, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That's true in ministry. That's also true in the fact that God has called them. And he's not going to change his mind. He's still called them to come unto him and to receive Jesus and be righteous. So, they're going to come to that place. More than likely, it's going to come during the time of the tribulation when the gospel is going to be preached. Those two witnesses are going to get up there and they're going to preach for 1260 days. And all the things that are going to happen, it's going to br bring them to the place of receiving Jesus. And you're going to see that during that time, they are going to get the gospel, and they're going to be preaching the gospel, as it says. Now, over in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, here we see in verse 3, 
For I say, through the grace given unto me. Again, grace comes from God. It's given unto him. You can't do anything to get it. He gives it to you. But at the same time, we've seen all the principles showing the conditions that you meet that causes that to come to you because he chooses to give it to those who meet his conditions. But it's not as if you earn it, so you don't get mixed up with this. It's not as though you've earned it or done anything, no. But you meet the conditions and God chooses to do it totally because he wants to do it. He is showing that. Otherwise, it's not like you, made, you earned it or made a deal, now he's got to give it to you. It doesn't work that way. God is giving it to you because of what he, he chooses to, but it's because of what he sees in your life. And it's through his word. His word of his grace will produce that. The grace given unto me, if every man among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, you get pride in there, you're going to shut down the grace of God. But to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man, the measure of faith. And now he's talking about the gifts that he gives to you. There are different gifts, and we talked about this this morning, but let's talk about this. That the grace gifts that God gives to you, as it says in Romans 12, 6, these are motivational gifts that he gives to you. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us. Everybody has different gifts. Now it says, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Ministry, that's service. One who's serving, let us wait on our ministry. He that teaches, one who's teaching, on his teaching. He that exhorts, someone who's exhorting people, calling them to repentance, telling them what they need to be doing, on exhortation. He that gives, he's got a financial ministry, he's giving. God's using him to help fund the gospel. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, one's in that position of ruling, he's supposed to do it with diligence, governing in some aspect. He that shows mercy, Mercy. These are people with mercy motives, reaching out to people. They do it with cheerfulness, showing mercy. These are all different gifts. Everybody has different gifts that are given to them as far as motivation for ministry of what he has for you. And it carries with it uh, the means to be able to accomplish the, that gifting with you. So these are all motivational gifts that are given unto us. Now over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see a statement. We kind of made this before, but look what it says. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's right. You're nothing more than the work of the grace of God in your life. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. If I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. In other words, he's saying, that God's grace was upon him for the ministry that he had. What did he do? He labored more abundantly than them all. Hey, he took hold of this thing and he ran with it. He performed that ministry. Night and day, he's preaching the gospel every place. Yet not, but he says, yet not I, it's the grace of God that was with me. Otherwise, he was simply cooperating with God, doing his word, and it was God's grace operating through him because it wasn't him doing anything. You see, we don't, all the glory goes to God. We're not doing anything of ourself. What we're doing is the grace of God that God has given to us that's operating through us, that is ministering to people. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So you are no more than what the grace of God has produced in your life. By the grace of God, you are what you are. Now, where people have got off, they think that, well, whatever God wants me to do, that's what I am. That's not what it's talking about by God's grace or whatever he decides. No, remember, you have a whole lot to play with getting the grace of God into your life. You're to grow in it, you're to take hold of it, you're to see the word of his grace manifest, to build you up, give your inheritance, all the things we've even seen so far, plus the scriptures we saw this morning, the, all the conditions for it. So, you are what you are for the grace of God based on you meeting the conditions to see the grace and the favor of God. And it's the grace of God which is operating through you, what he does in you and what he does through you. That is important to realize. Over in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, we see another place here, which shows the grace of God at work in your life to bring victory for you now. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word thanks is charis, which really means grace. 
So this is talking about, but grace to God, favor to God, which is giving us, because this is in the present tense, in the Greek, the word giveth, present tense, showing what he is doing, is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace or favor be to God. And what are you doing? When you're giving favor to God, you're essentially giving thanks again for his favor at work. They translated it thanks. But essentially what it's talking about is thanks because of his grace be to God that's operating. And what's the grace of God doing? It's giving you the victory. Everything that God is doing in your life is the grace of God working to bring forth his victory. That's why you've got to be sure you're in the position to see God's continual grace and favor working in your life. Whatever it is you're doing the word, God's grace is working. His favor is working on your behalf to give you the victory. In 2 Corinthians, we see chapter 2, verse 14, the same thing, essentially, where it says, thanks be unto God, same word, charis. Favor, thanks because of the grace and the favor be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Again, this is in the present tense, which is denoting what he is doing for us today to bring us into the place of victory. Thanks for the grace be unto God, which is, who is always causing us to triumph. What does that mean? If you're cooperating with God and doing what he says, he's always working to give you victory. He's always working to cause you to triumph. He's always working to bring you favor and victory in your life. Don't think for a minute that God won't, isn't, isn't available and the grace of God, the favor of God, isn't available to work on your behalf to give you victory and to always cause you to triumph. If you don't believe, if you think that, well, I wonder if, God, if God's not going to do anything, you just believe the lie. The grace of God is always available for you. That's the way God does. It's his favor working on your behalf, praise God. And that's exactly what he wants to bring forth for you and for me. Over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, understanding all these things, seeing how the grace of God works in everything we do to bring his power, to bring his promises, to bring all the things that he does. Now, let's see what we see in Paul's thorn. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Paul's speaking, I got all this abundance of revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, traditional teaching has said, even some translations have said, that he was conceited, that he was trying to exalt himself, and that's what a lot of the traditional teaching says, that he was given this thorn in the flesh to, keep, to get, get, get this, make this guy humble so he would not be exalted above measure and get a big head. That's what it teaches. You're, all, you're not, not in your head. Some translations even say it that way. It's a lie. It's totally the opposite. Notice. Through the abundance of revelations, who gave the revelations? God did. What was the purpose of God giving revelation to him? So he'd know the gospel. Paul's the one who wrote most of the New Testament, got the revelation of what happened with Jesus Christ. And what was he supposed to do? Go and preach it to everybody else. What would God want? Everybody to receive that. What would the devil want? I don't want anybody to hear this. So what did the devil do? There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, and who did it come from? Satan, not God. The messenger, which is the word angelos, which has been translated angel throughout the word of God. Look at it here. 186 times, 179 times it's translated angel. So it's talking about an angel, which means it's an evil angel, which means it's an evil spirit, a devil. So a devil or an evil spirit from Satan was sent to do what? To buffet me. Was this God? No. So what's he doing? Buffet means to strike, blow after blow after blow. Blow after blow after this devil, devil was just trying to smite him and keep, hit him with blow after blow. Why was he doing that? Lest, or so that, I should be, lest I should be exalted above measure, otherwise to stop me from being exalted. In other words, what was really happening? God was trying to exalt Paul, and the devil was trying to stop him from being exalted. Because who does the exalting? God was. Was Paul trying to exalt himself? No. God was doing the exalting. And that is very important to understand. 
In fact, let's go over and look at a scripture here for a moment. It's over in uh, verse t uh, 10 where it talks about uh, for humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, which actually means to be made low, and he shall lift you up. That means he's going to exalt you. We see the same thing. It's over in 1 Peter, in chapter 5, over here in verse 6. Humble yourselves. And by the way, this doesn't mean you humble yourself. The reason you know that is because as you look at the passive voice, that means somebody else is doing the action. And it's also aorist, meaning it's past tense verb. That's why it should be translated humbled. And because it's passive voice, that means somebody else is doing the action, not the subject. That's why it's not humble yourself, because what would be the understood subject? You. Humble yourselves, right? Are you humbling yourself? That means you're doing the action. Is that what the verse says? No. It literally, that's why Young translates it correctly. Be humbled. And it's a command from God. Who's humbling you? God is. Under what? The mighty hand of God, the powerful hand of God. The power of God will humble you as you are submissive to it through the working of the Word of God. And what's going to be the result when God accomplishes His work in you through His mighty power? You will be brought low. You will be humbled. That's what happened to Paul. And then what's going to be the blessing? That He may exalt you in due time. Otherwise, there's a time when God will exalt you. Well, Paul, remember, he'd been out there in the Arabian Desert for three years, studying, getting the total revelation from God, just following everything that God told him to do. And so now, was when he's going forth in his ministry, now was the time that God was going to exalt him. And we see, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, Paul's thorn is all about the fact that the devil was buffeting him, striking him repeatedly, continuously, so that Paul would not be exalted in the eyes of the people as he was preaching the abundance of revelations because God wanted him to be people to receive the abundance of the revelations. So, what did Paul do? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times he sought the Lord that it might depart from me. He's going to God and asking God, get rid of this thing. God, I would like you to deliver me from this and cause this to depart. Is that what we're supposed to do with the devil? No. Remember, the Corinthian letters and the Th letters of the Thessalonians were the early letters. Paul was growing and developing in things just like everybody else. What did God say to him? Did he say, okay, I'll do this for you? No, he didn't say that. What did he say in the next verse? He said unto me, my grace, my favor, is sufficient or enough for you. Otherwise, I want this thing off of me. And he didn't do it. Instead, he says, hey, my favor is enough for you. Otherwise, the favor of God's available for you to do something about this situation. You can deal with this enemy, with the authority that we have. He was supposed to cast these spirits away or out, you know, speak to the mountains to be removed, take dominion over them, bind them, stop their works. But he didn't have his understanding of all of his authority yet. He was growing and developing these things well. Look what he says after that. You see, how was Paul trying to deal with things? He was trying to deal with them in the flesh. Remember what happened on the first missionary journey when you read through the book of Acts? First missionary journey, he got beat up left and right. I mean, he's chased out of every city almost, stoned, you know, left for dead. I mean, they're shouting him down. They're doing everything and stopping him. He had a very rough time on his first missionary journey. And what was that? That was that evil spirit buffeting him, striking at him repeatedly, hitting him in all kinds of ways. He had attacks in his physical bodies with the infirmities. He also had all kinds of attacks that came against him. You can see this because he talks about, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. All these things were coming against him. And this is exactly what happened in the first missionary journey. But after that, he got, he got what God told him, and then he turned the tables on everything, because after that, he got established in his authority, and he understood something. Because he said, my grace is enough or sufficient for you. And then he makes another statement. What will my grace do for you? It's going to bring my favor to you, which produces what? 
Remember what happened when they had a prayer meeting? They had great power and they had great grace. The grace of God through the Word of God in your life is going to produce the power of God operating you. Plus, when he learned about his authority and started operating authority and power, he started destroying the works of the devil instead of having the devil beating him up and him running from city to city. Instead, he put a stop to the works of the devil. How do we know this? Just look at the, what happened in the missionary journey after that. He, what did he do? In Acts chapter 16, he cast out that spirit of divination that was trying to hinder them. Uh, the other case in Acts 13, Eliamus the sorcerer, a mist of darkness came upon his eyes and he was blind, couldn't see. That took care of that one. And then later on, the serpent tries to get on him and he just shakes the thing off and revival breaks out on the island. The guy gets healed. You know, he's doing the works of God and he's not, any, nothing stopping him whatsoever because he understood what to do. Now, what's, what happened here? My grace is sufficient for my strength. What's the word strength? Dunamis. means power. My power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses. Infirmity means weaknesses. Same word. You put it over here, see where it says weakness, number 769, and then infirmities right below it. Same word, weaknesses. And what weaknesses are we talking about? I don't want to talk about any spiritual weaknesses. Weaknesses of the spirit is talking about weakness of the flesh. Because how is Paul trying to deal with things in the flesh? By his own power. Can you deal with devils by your own power? No. You've got to deal with spiritual authority and power. He says, my power is made perfect in your weakness, which is his weakness of flesh. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses of flesh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, or in the word rest means to take possession of and live in me and begin to manifest through him. In other words, the power of Christ was resident in him and began to operate through him so that instead of the devil chasing him out of the cities, he was chasing the devil out of the cities and God was moving mightily and bringing forth victory. You see, traditional teaching has been a big lie. It's absolutely a lie. God was not trying to stop him from exalting him. God was exalting him so that then all the revelations could come so that they would all receive and get born again and the gospel would do a great thing. So, we see that now the power of Christ would take possession and rest upon him so that he could operate in this, to deal with all these things. And of course, he could deal with every attack coming against him from then on. So this is what it's talking about. So that tells you what the grace of God will do. The grace of God is all you need. And how are you going to get the grace of God manifest? Through his word. And what's his word going to produce in you? Power. Remember the word in you is how you put the armor of God on so you're empowered within the power of God resident within you. And then how do you release the power of God? You begin to act on it, speak it, pray the word, use your authority, put the power of God in operation, releasing out of you with mighty force, which is what you do when you pray prayers of authority. So, he says, hey, I, I glory in all these weaknesses because the power of Christ is going to take possession and rest on me and manifest through me, and I'm going to deal with all these situations, and the devil's not going to stop me anymore. And that's exactly what happened in the book of Acts. So he turned everything around. So the answer is, the grace of God will produce the power of God in you in the measure that the word's in you and you put on the whole armor of God. And you can manifest that power mightily and it will operate through you. It'll take possession of you essentially and flow through you because you're to be a dynamo. You're to be a power of God resident in you just flowing and operating out of you. And it will deal with every attack of the enemy. So we got to get ourselves having the power of God resident within us. Praise God. Now, over in Galatians chapter 1, we'll just look a few more scriptures before we conclude for tonight. Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Going back into the law, was that going to see the power of God and drive out the devils and see them get victory and, and you know, over all their enemies? No. They were going right back into these things again, in the law. Which, which is not another, but there shall be some that trouble you. And we're perverting the gospel of Christ. Anybody that tries to get you away from the true 
gospel, remember there's a tr the true grace, the true gospel, is going to lead you into something that's not going to manifest power whatsoever. In fact, in Galatians later, he got after these guys. He said in Galatians 2, 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. That's what these guys were doing, because they were going back into the works of the law. For if righteousness come by the law, did you guys attain to righteousness? Nope. You were seeking it after the works of the law. Did you ever attain to it, all you Israelites, all you Jews that didn't receive Jesus? Nope. You only can receive it through Jesus. If you could get it by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What was the use of him dying? There's no purpose if we could have got it. But we couldn't get it because we had to have a new spirit, which is only what we could get through what Jesus accomplished when he was born from the dead. We have to get a new spirit, also accomplishing the redemption. So here they were setting aside. The word frustrate means to set aside or disregard the grace of God. They went back into trying to do it through the works of the law, and they were going nowhere. And this is what he says in chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. He says, you guys are foolish. Who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? How do you see the grace of God work? In obedience to the truth. Get the word in you? You do the word. The grace of God is operating through you in the measure that you are doing the word. They quit obeying the truth. Shut down the grace of God from working in their life. Also, these guys got to the place where he even gets after him in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, and he says, Christ has become no effect unto you. He can't do anything for you because you've turned away from doing what his word says. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Oh, lots of people say you can't fall from grace because it's eternal, you know, it's irresistible. Lies. You can fall from grace. In fact, if you quit doing the word, you fell from grace in a measure right there of what you withdrew and quit doing. So it's important that we realize we can fall from grace if we go back into the Old Testament ways. And so here we see that people think that you can't, you know, fall from grace. It's all a big lie. The truth is you can fall from grace. In fact, we'll show you a couple other scriptures that even show this. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see over here, verse 15, where it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. You can fail of the grace of God if you don't do the word and you're not walking right. Because what's it been talking about right before that? Following peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, if we're looking diligently to do what he says, then we won't fail. But looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. If you don't look diligently to do the things that God wants you to do, carry, carry out the word, what's going to happen? You're going to fail the grace of God. Is it God choosing to not do something? No. It's you choosing to not do something. Because you're the one that puts the grace of God into operation when you do His word. So we've seen many things tonight that are very important. We see again how the conditions of the grace of God are shown, and the grace of God works through the Word of God. The grace of God works to produce the power of God resident in you. The Word of God is so important, it's going to give, build you up, give you your inheritance, all these things, which is the grace of God working. In fact, everything that happens in your life that God's doing is really the grace of God. It's the favor of God working on your behalf through His Word, bringing forth His power leading you in triumph, causing you to gain victory, causing you to possess all of your promises that belong to you in Christ. That's why it says, I am what I am because of the grace of God. Everything that I am is because of the grace of God. Everything you are that God has done is because of the grace of God. And again, it's not just him arbitrarily deciding, I'm going to bless you and not you and we'll leave you out and maybe you and this kind of stuff. No, that's lies. Oh, it's not also that the grace is on you forever. It doesn't matter what you do. It's automatic, you know, irresistible. Lies. Don't fall for that kind of teaching, unfortunately, that's been prevalent in the body of Christ, and it goes on in this area right here. It's all lies from the devil. Grace has conditions. And you and I are going to do what he says. And what's he want us to do? He wants us to take hold of the abundance of grace through the word, through the promises, all the things that he has. 
through the ministry we have, through doing His Word. That's how you take hold of it. And through the gift of righteousness, you're now going to reign in life. And you're going to walk in victory. 2 Peter 3, just reminds you of this. Verse 18, the scripture we looked at before. Grow in grace. God would never tell us to grow in grace if we could.